you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, we're in the third part of a five-part series entitled Five Realities of Love as found uh, in 1 John. Uh, we talked about the source of love, we talked about the sacrifice of love. Today we're going to talk about the, the, the show of love. Uh, God's love is active and present in the world today. But it must be seen. And the question would arise, how can God's love be seen? And it's only demonstrated through the community of faith. Who's the community of faith? We are. The children of God, the church of Jesus Christ. But the problem is, do we show God's love? You ever think about that? The way I react when I don't get my way, say, in Walmart and go in the line, or you don't get a doctor quite as fast as you want one. Uh, are you still showing God's love when you're under stress? Are you showing God's love when things don't always go your way or when you've been offended? Um, it, it, I thought that was a good uh, lesson uh, for the kids to try to love each other. Loving your brother and sister can be tough when you're little, can't it? They buy their toys, other possessions, they fight over parents' time to who's going to get the most attention. Uh, so, so it's tough, but loving is something that we are commanded by God to do. So we're going to look at the show of love this week, just one verse. Uh, if you stand with me, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12. The Bible says there, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another... God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Uh, Brother Chris, would you pray for us again? Dear Heavenly Father God, I just thank you so much for your word, Father Lord, which stands true forever and ever, Father God, and just help us dive into it, Father Lord. Just help our heart uh, and our soul and our mind, Father Lord, just uh, grab a hold of whatever it is that you may have for us this morning, Father God. And just thank you so much for your love, Father Lord. Thank you so much for loving us when we was just filthy, rocky, uh, uh, filthy, rugged, nasty rags, Father Lord, of, of unholiness, Father God. And you sent your son for us, Father Lord, because you loved us. Lord, help us, Lord, to love, Father Lord, and help us learn how to love, Father Lord, even our, even our enemies, Father Lord. For surely you have made us for a time of such now, Father Lord, as there seems to be a, just an eeriness on the on the horizon, Father God, but we know, Lord, that you sent your son Jesus, Lord, the Prince of Peace, who is a rise on the white horse, Father God. You sent him, you sent him for us, Father Lord, and, and that we may be a voice, Father Lord, a voice in the wilderness, Father, a, a light in the darkness, Father Lord. Help us, Lord, to learn how to love. Amen. We ask these things in the holy, mighty, powerful, precious, loving name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 This morning, I mean, we're going to look at four elements in, in the fact of showing love. And the very first one is something that, that well, is kind of offhanded when he starts this verse out. The elimination of falsehood. We haven't talked much about Gnosticism in our study of love through John. Uh, but if you remember back in Colossians, when we went through that book and studied through it, uh, there was a lot of Gnosticism that had crept into the church. John's writing probably 40 years later when Gnosticism has really started to develop in the church. And there were Gnostic teachers and false teachers, as John has already mentioned in this book, uh, that were claiming to have special visions that was giving them an insight in, into what uh, God's law was and God's rule was and God's revelation for them and, and how to live. And John is going to eliminate that falsehood uh, and, and refute it because he says no one not even one, none at all, has seen. The word seen means to discern with the eyes, to behold, to view attentively, or to contemplate something. It indicates the sense of a wondering consideration. In other words, nobody has seen God in his fullness, in his essence. Uh, and, and these Gnostics were claiming to have had visions of God, and because they claimed to have a vision of God, their revelation was greater than what scripture had already revealed of God and you know uh, if you're a conservative Bible believer you know that anything that is not of scripture is not of God That's right. 
simply put. Uh, and, uh, and, and in, in today's society, we have people who are more concerned with appeasing people and with fitting in with society than standing on the efficiency and, and the sufficiency of God's holy word of the scriptures that he has given to us. Paul says, no one has seen God. And, uh, okay, the, the word God in the Greek language, if you look at the way this is written, the word God is in the emphatic position. It is the very first word in this sentence which draws attention and focuses on the main point of this verse. And what it literally, what it literally reads is that God no one has yet, never seen as of yet. And when it says God, there is no definite article with the word God. So what that implies to us is that uh, it is talking about the character or the essence or the very nature of God, and it says at, at, at any time, meaning not, not yet or never. Now, that raises the question to us. What about the passages in the Old Testament that says Moses talking to God face to face? What about when God appeared in different forms to different people? He appeared to Abraham, right? So there are theophanies, there are appearances of God. But God himself said that no man can see me and live. So how can that scripture be true if this scripture is true? And what you have to do, the balance that you have be between those is that in God's divine essence, in the fullness of who he is and his godly nature, no one has ever completely seen God. The Bible says... Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.17 that God is invisible. John said that God is invisible. So these statements can't be wrong. So when he took Moses and put him in the cleft of the rock and the presence of God passed by, he allowed Moses to see, the Bible says, his back or just a little bit of God's glory. So the Bible is absolutely true when it says here that no man has ever seen the fullness and the excellence of the essence of the divine being of God. Why? Because God is a spirit. John 4, 24. Spirits are invisible. Jesus says spirits don't have flesh and blood as he did. So in John 1, 18, it says no man has seen God because he's invisible. But in that same verse, it says, but the Son of God has revealed who God is to us. In Colossians 1.15, it says that Jesus is the exact image of the invisible God. So what that tells us, and if you read a little bit about this, you'll see in the Old Testament, God would assume different forms of humanity so that he could confront mankind uh, with his revelation and with his uh, good news to them so that they could relate to what they were seeing, not that they saw God in his essence, right? You, you saw God in the pillar of fire and in the, and in the cloud that led the people through the wilderness for 40 years. But they never saw the absolute completeness of God. So that is a true statement, and he is saying that in order to refute the false teachings. You have people today who claim that there's a new revelation from God. Friends, there is no new revelation. That's right. And I know this is not talking about love. And we're on a, a love chapter. We're going to get to that. But you, you have to deal with this first because we have so many people today that say Scripture is not sufficient. Scripture is not efficient for your spiritual growth and for your spiritual stability in life. So scripture gives you no guidelines, no principles that are relative to today, and it does. Because God is immutable and changeable, and God cannot be any less than who he is. So the first thing he had to do was to eliminate the falsehood, and then he talks about the exercise of brotherhood. The next part of that verse says, if we love one another. If. Interesting word. Uh, the book, okay. Love originated in God. It was manifested in his son. Jesus is the fullness of who God was bodily without the sin nature. And it's demonstrated in God's people. So the answer to the question, how does God see people love today? Through us. Through the church. 
When the church is a giving church, when the church is a missionary church, when the church is a Bible-believing church, when it's reaching out to meet the needs in the community, when it meets the needs inside of the church, when we come to church and we love one another and we work together in unity and harmony and we cooperate with, with each other, that is how we are showing God's love. When we love people who are unlovable, when we love people who are mean to us and curse us and talk about us and run us down, it is showing the love of God. This morning, our Sunday school lesson, now Luke chapter 6, was all about love and how, and how we are to live by a certain principle. And that principle is simply that I have been forgiven, so I need to forgive. God loves me, so I need to love, right? right. We talked last week. Is there, is there any doubt that God loves you? Is there any doubt that God loves you? Right. No, not, not, at, not uh, any at all. Because the historical fact of the revelation of Jesus Christ being born in the human body and dying on the cross for my sin is a historical event and proof that God loves me. So I am to demonstrate that love. And then he goes on, he says, if, if we love one another. Uh, the word if is a third class condition of probability with uncertainty. Man, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Yes, Technicality. What does it simply mean? It is possible that you will love one another, but it's not a 100% guarantee. Right. We as Christians are commanded to love. Yes, sir. Jesus said, if you love me, love one another. We looked at the golden rule this morning, right? Verse 31 of Luke chapter 6. So if we're to love each other, there should be a possibility there of uncertainty. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I should love you regardless of whether you are reciprocating that love toward me, whether you are favorable toward me, whether you hate me with a, or you despise me. That doesn't matter on my condition and what I should reflect and deal with you on the basis because I've been forgiven, I should forgive, and if God loves me, then I should love you. That's our principle. So we should love one another. There should be no uncertainty in that whatsoever. If everybody in the church loved everybody in the church, what a joyous occasion Sunday morning would be. Amen. Amen. Heard a man say this morning, worship, there is no such thing as dull worship. Because if you come to church, worship should be a joyful occasion and experience where we come together knowing that people here love me regardless of who I am and how I act and what I do and they love me with that unconditional love then we can come together and celebrate and worship and praise God and leave this place better off than we were when we got here. Amen. Why? Because I'm doing what God asked me to do and has commanded me to do. I'm loving one another. Everybody has something about themselves that irritates at least one other person. Now, I know y'all don't do that. I know y'all have no bad qualities. You have no little you know, idiosyncrasies that, that would you know, kind of rub the feathers. I understand that. Some do. Those are the ones who need to be loved. Not the perfect person. It's the person that you walk by and you want to go, Pow! I remember what you did last week and what you said last year. It's that person that you want to walk by and say, I'm glad to see you this morning. I'm glad you're here. You go home and you pray for that person that God will change that heart and change that attitude and that they'll get just like you are and that they'll love you as much as you love them and what a better place we take. Amen. If we love one another, he said, if you love, the word love is, is, is agape love, present tense verb, which means a, 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 a continual, habitual action, and it, it, it indicates the direction of the will and finding one's joy in something or someone else. Let me ask you this morning, do you find joy in your brothers and sisters in Christ? Amen. Is coming to church a job? Is coming to church a, a burden? It ought to be a joy. It ought to be an occasion that I look forward to going to church. We're, uh, we're thinking about starting a Wednesday night prayer meeting. Uh, because I think you need something in the middle of the week Amen. to boost you up. Uh, there was an old song out years ago that said, I need a shot of rhythm and blues. About Wednesday, I got the blues. 
And I need a shot of spirituality to lift me up and to energize me so I can deal with the rest of the week that's going to be just as bad as the first part of the week. And I find that when I come together with people who love each other genuinely. Love God. If you genuinely love God, you can love other people because the love it's talking about here is a God thing, love, not phileo love. Phileo love is brotherly love, a comfortable kind of loving. You know, I love this pair of shoes. They're real comfortable. That's phileo. But God's love is that I love you because I want the best for you. What does that mean? That means that I'm willing to rescind or let go of some of my privileges and, and, and my uh, priorities. And I say, man, I want Chris to go spiritually, so I'm going to love Chris so he can go spiritually. But it doesn't matter what somebody else has done to you. Now that's humanly impossible. That's humanly impossible. Amen. Amen, it is. Because the human flesh wants to get even. I mean, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. You talk about me, I'm talking about you. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. See, that's, that's the sin nature. But God says that if I continually look at you and want you to be better, then I've got to love you into that. Sure. I can't force you into it. Change subjects for a minute. How many of you men know you can't force your life to do something? <laughs> <laughs> some said yeah, some said I don't know about answering that. <laughs> you know you can't. Go ahead and tell the truth. You have to love them into it. Right. And you can't force someone to grow spiritually. You can't force someone to, to be a member of the church and be a, part, a participating, active member lifting the church up if you don't love them into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. Loving each other. Looking at each other and wanting that person to be better than they were. Because when God saved you, He loved you enough not to leave you in the condition you were in. That's right. He improves on you. He progressively grows you and develops you. Uh, the Bible says that, that we've been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit of God, we've been predestinated by the Holy Spirit of God that we can be conformed to the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God saves you, He knows you're not a loving person by nature. This is God's love, not man's love now. Man's love loves because they get something back. But God's love loves because He can give you something. Major difference there. So if we love one another, then we have the, we, we're insured of brotherhood. What keeps the church together? Appropriate song this morning, Scott has. The bond of love. It's the bond of love empowered by the supernatural Holy Spirit that keeps us together as a church. And that's what makes the church grow. That's what makes the church a church. Uh, the word abides. It says in that verse, uh, I'll read that. If we love one another, God abides in us. Abides. Again, present that in the tense verb means a habitual action. It refers to the relationship in which one person or something stands with another. To be and remain united with him, one in heart, mind, and will. A church that is a loving church that loves one another will not have major trouble. I'm not saying you won't have skirmishes. We're human. We're going to disagree on something somewhere sooner or later down the line. We're going to disagree. How we deal with that disagreement is going to show the amount of love that we have for one another. That's right. And he says here, he says, my relationship to you is based on my relationship to God. That's right. And if I don't love God first, I'm definitely not going to love you. She asked those kids this morning, do you love yourself? I'll ask you the same thing. Do you love yourself? Everybody be honest. Yes. <laughs> yes. Do I want what's best for me spiritually? Yes. Physically? Yes. Mentally? Yes. So I should want even more for you. That's right. Because if you grow spiritually, if you grow more in your love and progress in that loving relationship, wouldn't that make me better? And wouldn't it benefit everybody in the church if we love one another? 
And if we do that, we have a promise from God that he's going to abide. Now, this is not a, a, a command or a restriction. What this is is a benefit from loving one another. Second, moving on to that. It says he remains, abides in, remaining in place, uh, means uh, uh, an idea of rest, stability, security. See, I'm secure when I come to church on Sunday morning because I know now I can be myself. That's right. That's right. Uh, you, you can't go and it's going to get worse. You, you can't go in public and be yourself. Uh, I told you this morning, uh, I'm going to rehab right now, and I talk to these people, and they ask me, how are you doing? I say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed and highly favored. And, and they don't, they just simply don't get it. Because I don't believe any of them in the church. And they don't understand the concept that every day, every day I wake up to Jesus. That's right. Not just me, any true believer. That's right. You wake up and they know that I'm still a Christian. I'm still saved. I've still got the presence of the Holy Spirit working in my life. And I do that. And when I'm reminded of that, I'm reminded that I need to love you so that you can love me more. And in doing that, I am ensuring that we're going to have a brotherhood and a fellowship and a relationship here with this church. And everybody should want that. Thirdly, the exhibition of brotherhood. It says in the last part of that verse, He abides with us, and His love, God's love, God's faith love, has been perfected in us. Love is that self secret love of God, not man, uh, not man's love. It involves God doing what He knows is best for man, and not necessarily what man desires. Again, God loves you too much to leave you like you were. That's right. God's improving you every single day. Spiritual growth, uh, being a member of the church, or being a Christian, just being a Christian. You should grow and develop every single day. And, and God's love is a self-sacrificing love, and he's sacrificing because he wants you to have the best that you can be, and that is exactly what I should be doing for you. Uh, I should be loving you so you can be who, uh, who God wants you to be. So his love is perfected. Perfect passive tense verb, which means there's a point in history when something happens and it's passive, it's being done to you completely, and it's got continuing results. The, God, the love of God is made perfect by reaching the intended goal. It's used here metaphorically, meaning to make perfect through, uh, perfect, although not faultless, but bring it to a state of completion or fulfillment. So what's it saying? It says that God's love when you love one another, remain in you so you can have fellowship with God because you've got a relationship of salvation. But that the fellowship re remains fresh and new every single day. And then he said here, as we do that, that God's love is working in you so that it can be completed or brought to, the, brought to an end. See, God wants us to love each other. That's right. Because he loves us and he is working in us so that his love can be perfected. And when that love is perfected or completed, then the world who is on the outside of the world, uh, who, who loves only with man's love, will see something different with a Christian person. That the love that they have is a supernatural love that is greater than any love that they got. And see, the whole point of what this is saying is that if I love like Jesus loved, the world's going to pay attention. That's right. We studied this morning. If I love uh, someone, sinners love each other. Sinners do good to each other. Sinners even long to each other. And if that's all I do, then I'm doing no more than the world. But if I'm loving with that supernatural empire ability to reach out and love you regardless of your failures or your faults, regardless of your actions or your words, if I can do that and do that sincerely, then I'm going beyond what an everyday average man would do and I'm showing the world the love of God. That is how we show love. It's not by coming to church. 
It's not by being a holy roller and leading people over the head and being judgmental and all this other stuff and being a religious person. It's not that. It's that I'm willing to sacrifice myself on the throne of grace so that you can be better than what you are. That you can grow spiritually. And when I do that, and the world sees that in action. You've heard those saying that I'd rather see a sermon than hear one anytime. See, when, when people see a church loving, getting along, working together, cooperating, doing things together, fellowship and eating meals, wouldn't you love to get back to a pot like that? Oh, yeah. Or a hot dog stuff. Have the band playing, have some music, have the kids doing something. I'm sitting tired of not having fellowship. Because that's part of church. But when you do that, and you do that genuinely, people see something different about you. And that is what's going to make a difference in the world. It's not the government. It's not the way society looks at things. It's not humanism. It is the love of Jesus Christ in the hearts of true believers that is shared with people who maybe not be who, who maybe are not in God's family, but who need to be. See, you may be the instrument that God is going to look, use to love somebody into his kingdom. Would you like to do that today? Would you like to be that instrument? Would you like to be that person that that, that people say, hey man, you know, there's, you guys act a little bit different. What is it? And you can say, because God loves me, I love you. Regardless. Unconditional love. Are we showing God's love to a lost and dying world? Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word said last week that you loved us, not that we loved you. Help us, dear God, to reciprocate that love to a lost world that needs to see, uh, in this day and age, that needs to see the love of Jesus Christ expressed in and through his people that the world may be a better place. Father, I pray today that we would commit ourselves afresh and anew to not only loving one another, but to loving the world in which we live and praying for that love to be a determining factor in the world in which we live. We pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.